All right. Good morning, BRR members. My name is Cameron Kinzer, and I'm the Director of Government Affairs here at the Association, and welcome to our fourth quarter 59-minute meeting where we will be discussing housing, growth, and transportation, as well as a few other big stories from 2020. There, we didn't have a shortage of any big stories, so this should be a good discussion. I want to thank our panelists for being here. Uh, Scott McIntosh is the Opinion editor at the Idaho Statesman, Margaret Carmel is at a reporter at the Boise Dev, and you probably know her from Idaho Press. And uh, George Prentice is the host of Morning Edition on Boise State Public Radio at NPR. So, panelists, thanks for being here. Let's jump right into it. Um, starting with a question about the election. We had some significant turnover on the Ada County Board of Commissioners. Ryan Davidson beat incumbent. Diana Lachiando and Rod Beck beat Bill Rutherford for the seat that was previously held by Rick Visser. Uh, Scott, this first question will go to you. What do you think fueled Davidson's win over Lachiando despite her fundraising advantage? And what changes do you see coming from the board in the next couple of years? Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I, you know, I think there are a couple of reasons. Um, one is, and I did a column on this last month, but um, the, the number of votes that Ryan Davidson received in Ada County um, in the election almost mirrored uh, exactly um, the number of votes received by Donald Trump. So I definitely think there was a, a Trump bump um, in uh, Idaho and in particular in um, Ada County as well. Um, and then the other thing, too, is that just even though uh, Diana Lachiando had a fundraising advantage, I, I don't think you can discount the um, fundraising and spending that came from a couple of uh, key uh, political action committees. There was the Conservative Citizens of uh, Cit Concerned Citizen, Conservative Citizens for Thoughtful Growth, um, and the um, Building Contractors Association of Southwest Idaho. Um, they had uh, 83000 and 130000 um, dollars respectively. We don't know exactly how that money was spent, but we do know that the conservative citizens uh, for thoughtful growth um, did spend a lot of money on attack ads, uh, attacking Diana Lachiando, calling her a radical social or socialist and the social agenda and, and all sorts of things. So I think those... The, the Trump bump and the, the spending from, from political action committees contributed to that, that victory. Oh, and then I think the changes, I think, you know, we interviewed, our editorial board interviewed um, all four candidates. And I do, it, obviously, Ryan Davidson and Rod Beck were much more um, in favor of fewer restrictions and, and regulations. Um, wanting to uh, increase the housing stock and building stock and encourage um, more building um, in Ada County, um, fewer regulations, um, cutting taxes, uh, that those were their, their, their main mantras uh, during the campaign. So I think that's what we're gonna see. Rod Beck and uh, Ryan Davidson, Republicans will be the majority, uh, two out of three commission uh, members, Kendra, Kendra Kenyon will be in the minority, and I suspect you're going to see a lot of two-to-one votes um, with Rod Beck and, and Ryan, David, Ryan Davidson setting the, the agenda for the commissioners. Margaret, you want to jump in on that question? Yeah, so I, I'm going to agree with everything Scott said. I think that, you know, there were some, some Democrats in Boise that were really shocked by her loss. Um, but I think that when you consider the way that that board is set up and how we vote for it, that it is elected countywide, it, it, it really wasn't that shocking. La Chianda won in 2018 in a blue wave year when there were not any um, national Republicans on the ballot, um, you know, like Donald Trump was not on the ballot. And that was a, that was a banner year for, for Democrats, um, especially in Ada County where they picked up those two seats in District 15 that they didn't used to have. And um, so she was kind of competing in a more favorable environment. And then this year it was like a triple whammy of, she's become the face of lockdowns. You know, conservatives referred to her as Lockdown Lachiando on Facebook. You know, she has been kind of, even though she was not the only person on Central District Health voting for some of these restrictions, 
you know, she has become kind of the mascot for that and on social media. And then also then, so you've got that, you have the Building Contractors Association funding a lot of those attack ads that um, were very much kind of look like a national Republican attack ad. Um, very, you know, playing up, connecting her to California, connecting her to radical green energy. It was, and, and the, that those ads ended up having to get taken down because she was, she was getting threats on top of the threat she was already getting from her votes on CDH. And so I used to read those comments whenever I would see the ads pop up on Facebook and there was some really intense negative energy there. And, and that's not to say that I'm, you know, as a reporter, I'm nonpartisan. I'm not going to be supporting a candidate or the other. But whenever you see a candidate, no matter what party, and you just see reams and reams of comments of just intense anger, really intense anger, it's, it kind of, it kind of gives you pause. Um, and then the other part is just that all of Ada County was going to elect her. She's not just getting elected by Boise. Those seats are not by district. And so you know, that's why the Ada County uh, Commission was Republican for so long. Um, but I'll just speak a little bit briefly to what the changes are going to be, you know, in the coming years now that that uh, district, that commission has flipped. I think there's going to be a lot of questions about what they're going to do in terms of capital needs. Ada County is, you know, said for years that they're really behind on jail capacity. They're really behind on um they need a new coroner facility. I think there's been there's been many news articles about how that facility is so outdated and undersized. You know, I think I read somewhere they were, you know, they were dealing with stacking bodies on top of each other before the pandemic. You know, I can't imagine what it looks like in there now. Um, and also some of the questions about what are we going to do about Expo Idaho and how to redevelop that site. Um, you know. Ryan Davidson and, and Rod Beck are, are probably going to be less less inclined to be spending um, county money on on some of these projects. I know when I talked to both of them in the lead up to the election, I asked about some of these public facilities, and you know the it was they were a lot less supportive of say a new coroner's facility, and um, you know they they kind of. Um, the jail, they were a little bit more supportive on. I think when I initially talked to Rod Beck, he, he was less in favor. And then he, he, we talked later and I, I, I get the impression it was after he talked to Sheriff Bartlett, um, that the, that the jail was, you know, more necessary. Um, but I think that that's really going to set the stage for the county keeping up with the facilities they need for growth. So those are kind of my, my major questions, you know, beyond the immediate question of with La Chiando leaving Central District Health and potentially being replaced by, you know, a more conservative person, whether that's Ryan Davidson or someone else, what are those COVID restrictions going to look like in the pandemic response? But I think that if you think even longer term, this is going to have, you know, just this is going to be a major shift in how we're thinking about spending taxpayer dollars. George? Well, if she had run for Boise City Commissioner, she would have done fine, uh, but, uh, but that's not the job. And I was looking at the heat map as well, Scott, and I found a precinct that Joe Biden actually won, that Dinah Lachando lost. Uh, mm -hmm. Not only did she lose precinct 1503, but her margins weren't strong enough in other uh, uh, precincts west uh, in, in West Boise, uh, near the uh, Boise School District on Victory Road. Uh, her margin was, was barely enough uh, near Ada County elections. Um, so, uh, so her margins just weren't good enough. And the fact that she lost a precinct that Joe Biden won, uh, that just, that's, you're, you're not going to uh, have any luck in any Democrat who runs for a county office in a presidential year. Uh, well, that, that's an uphill battle at best. Um, Ryan Davidson tagged her with Lockdown Lachiando. You're absolutely right. It stuck. His answer to almost everything was, well, let the market sort it out. Uh, he's not a fan of government changing things. And uh, 
So I have a feeling that that's going to be his answer for a lot of proposals that will go forward um, uh, with himself and, and Mr. Beck. And I think it's also fair to say that they are Trump Republicans. Yeah, th there was another um, issue that was raised a couple months ago. The uh, county commissioners who talked about doing a zoning code re rewrite, and I had a question about that, but I also want to combine it with Boise's zoning code rewrite. I want to start with Margaret on this one. Um, do you see the, at the county level that process proceeding um, as it's scheduled, which I believe they said that they would be done in 2022 with uh, the countywide zoning rewrite, and how do you see that um, working in uh, conjunction with Boise's effort to do the same thing. Um, when we look at other municipalities around the country, um, they always talk about uh, making the zoning codes more efficient for affordable housing and workforce housing. How do you see those two efforts uh, working together uh, to the benefit of the residents of Ada County? That's an interesting question. Um, prior to the flip of the commissioners, I would say that those would, would work together relatively well. Um, but I'm not, I, I don't really know what that's going to look like now that Ada County is going to have, you know, Republican commissioners kind of leading that effort or even, you know, just how they're going to approach it. Because the way that Boise is approaching it is they're, they're looking at, you know, making, making the zoning code more efficient and kind of, but, but with an eye toward making mixed use development, denser projects, easier to build and really emphasizing this idea of walkability and trying to get towards development that's more transit oriented. Now, I will say that is not an up zone. They're not doing eliminating single family zoning. They're, you know, they're not, um, you know, doing any some of the, these more radical zoning rewrites that you see in, in other cities like, like Minneapolis or, or I, I heard something about Washington did a pretty intense, you know, evaluation of single family zoning recently but you know they are l looking for you know toward this more sustainable cities model of let's try to do infill and 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 that and and build up the city that way instead of sprawling out you know you can't see my arms because of zoom but um and Ada County, I don't know how they're going to approach that because Diana Lachiando very much kind of, when I talked with her about that, you know, she had those ideas of, okay, suburbs, these sprawling suburb developments like Avamore and, um, you know, massive subdivisions getting proposed out by CUNA, they cost more money than they bring in in taxes to serve. And so she, you know, she was kind of looking at it with an eye of, if we can't, you know, we need to try to figure out how to do, how to do more to fund services and, and, and kind of plan out these, the, the growth a little bit more in her words, thoughtfully, so that it, you know, the Treasure Valley didn't just become one big sprawling subdivision with one acre lots because the, the county can't keep up with what it has already. Um, but but I don't know I don't necessarily so so and I think that comes with some of the the frustration that people in the contractors association had with her because she was kind of you know working on limiting some of those some of those really far flung subdivisions so now that the Republicans are going to be in charge I don't know what that's going to look like and if they're going to address their zoning code in a way that kind of is more infill and 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 focused less on on sprawling my my guess is they won't is that they will kind of continue in that same trajectory we're seeing now where we have these massive you know subdivisions that are are diff for, difficult to serve difficult to serve with um taxpayer resources george you want to go second on this one Sure. Um, so looking at the city, uh, Lauren McLean isn't terribly different than uh, Dave Beter was, uh, which is to say build up and uh, as opposed to building out. Uh, and I know we're going to talk a little bit about this uh, um, housing bonus ordinance where uh, they want to incentivize developers. Uh, and they're already getting pushback uh, from both sides on that. Um, simply put, I think people's eyes gloss over when you start talking about zoning and zoning rewrites until... Uh, it's their neighborhood until it's their block. And, uh, uh, but zoning, I think, and taxes will most likely be the catalyst for what will probably be change on the Boise City Council. Um, 
uh, three of those seats are going to be on the ballot in November, next November, and uh, and those seats will have to be uh, district centric, uh, where zoning is going to be elevated, I think, a bit more as opposed to the current at large seats. So. Uh, uh, the city wants to basically do it project by project incrementally, uh, but uh, that they're already getting pushback from both sides on this debate. Yeah, I think the only thing I'll add, you know, when it comes to Ada County, I think you're going to see a lot more um, deference to developers. I think you're just, you know, if somebody wants to build another Avamore, I think the chances are pretty good that they'll be able to get it approved, whereas under um, La Chiando um, and Kenyon uh, combined, there, were, there was a, a more difficult uh, chance of that happening. And now I think there's going to be more opportunity for, the, for those kinds of developments. So <clears throat> we talked a little bit about infill. We've always advocated for smart growth in terms of infill housing that's connected to infrastructure where it makes sense, not just building uh, anywhere and everywhere. Um, but as infill continues to, the space for infill continues to fill up, where do you see development moving since there's that push-pull between those planned subdivisions out in unincorporated Ada County that the developers want, but there hasn't been a compromise on how we pay for those services and the ongoing services. So, George, I'll start with you on that one. Well, um, I think the test case so far has been uh, proposals in, uh, in West Boise. Um, it was formidable, uh, the pushback, and it was very telling. Uh, I know that uh, the city uh, wants modest changes in density, or so they say, uh, one project at a time. Uh, it could help uh, them meet uh, their uh, density and, and housing goals, but uh, even I think those changes could uh, test the limits of a lot of Boiseans' uh, comfort levels. Uh, uh, but the debate is uh, significant, and there's more of these projects proposed uh, consuming what uh, used to be farmland uh, to the west and the south, uh, property values. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's not really building housing at the low end of the market. Um, and I think that that's probably a bigger debate that more people want to have. Scott? Yeah, and I think when you're talking about Boise, I guess if, if, if I'm a developer, I would start getting really good at building up. So I think when you're talking about where you're going to build, I, I suppose the path of least resistance is to build three houses per acre in Meridian. Um, and that, that seems to be you know, a really sustainable model for developers. But I think if you're talking about Boise, I think you know, I'd start looking at, at how do I build uh, multiplexes? How do I build... Um, five, six story apartment buildings and condos. Um, you know, if you look at State Street, you know, when we talk about growth, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about building to accommodate growth. We're talking about, you know, growing by 100,000 people. Well, those 100,000 people are coming, you know, whether we build 100,000 new houses or not. Um, and we're just on a hamster wheel right now trying to keep up. And so I think if you just look at the opportunities um, that exist already, particularly in the city of Boise, I think looking at higher densities and mixed densities, again, you know, the city of Boise is looking at mixed densities. So, you know, you're, if you're in a residential uh, zoned neighborhood, I think what's going to happen in the future is that you might be able to build a, a six unit apartment building in a residential uh, zone with commercial on the first floor. You know, there's going to be that mix um, in some of these residential zones. So I guess if I'm a developer, I, I would be looking at those opportunities um, to, to build higher density all over the city of Boise. Margaret? Yeah, I, I think I think Scott's right in, in, in that you're going to see more density and building up in the city of Boise. As far as where the development's going, I think it's going everywhere. Um, you know, I think, which obviously sounds like a cop-out answer. Um, but I think that what you're going to see is neighborhoods like the bench that are really close to downtown that still have, you know, that have land that's able to develop. You're going to see um, the infill projects there. And, um, you know, come to mind, there's been some multi-story 
apartment or townhouse developments built um, on the bench in near Vista, near the rim. And like kind of it's like developers are getting really creative with tucking them into these kind of like weirdly shaped lots. You know, you see a lot that looks like this and, and, and they'll build townhouses on it. Um, and I think that, you know, Scott's right in the sense that there's going to have to be this attitude shift where people are going to have to get a little bit more comfortable with, hey, maybe there's going to be a small apartment building on my block. And I don't necessarily know if we're at that level of comfort right now. I mean, you walk around the North End, right? And the North End is the most sought after neighborhood in, in, in Boise in a lot of ways. And you walk down the street and you'll see multiple expensive single family houses. And then you'll see a, a six unit apartment building um, or you'll see a duplex or, you know, and, and so there are, you know, I think there is a fear of people I talk to of living in a neighborhood that is does not have every house a single family house. And they're they're really and I and I use that word fear because people just get very upset and I will ask them, you know, I'm interviewing them, I'll say, well, why does this make you upset? Can you speak to that more? And 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 the answer is, I just don't like it. I just don't like it. I don't, you know, and and I think that in order for us to keep moving in a way the development that we can pay for, people are gonna have to kind of get a little bit more comfortable with that idea that they might live next door to someone who lives in an apartment or they might see an apartment uh, sometimes. And, and I just, I think we might, ha we have a long way to go before people get there. And I'm you know not trying to criticize anyone for how they feel because it's their neighborhood, but I think that things are rapidly changing and that, um, and, but at the same time, we're still sprawling. You know, I think that a lot of politicians in Boise have really said we can build up or we can sprawl. And, but right now we're doing both. We're building up and we're having this density that makes people uncomfortable and they get, they show up at city council meetings and they get upset. So we have that going on, but then we have Avamore and we have the, you know, we have these large one acre lots in Meridian and, you know, and, and so that's not slowing down, you know, it's, it's not one or the other right now, it's, it's we're doing both. And that's kind of creating a situation where the open space is disappearing and we're creating density of new apartments that are not necessarily affordable to working class people. And it's all occurring at the same time everywhere. Uh, we touched on this a little bit earlier, but the um, housing or the bonus housing ordinance that was before Boise uh, planning and zoning last night, getting a lot of attention. Um, that's aimed at more affordable workforce housing options for folks, but also uh, building up as um, Scott talked about. Um, what impacts do you see this effort having towards affordable housing, assuming that it does go through, it made it through planning and zoning? Uh, a final public hearing at the Boise City Council hasn't been set yet, but Scott, I'll start with you on that one. Yeah, and I, I, I'm going to defer a lot to, to Margaret. I think she's, you know, an expert in this in this field. But I will say, my hope is that we are able to. We have buildings in in all over the Treasure Valley, and but in particular in Boise, that are old and they're not worth saving. And that is that those old kind of falling apart buildings are the only places that we have for quote unquote affordable housing uh, for folks. That doesn't mean we should hold on to them. I personally, I, I don't think that means that we should hold on to derelict buildings or substandard buildings or falling apart buildings. So if there is anything we can do to incentivize replacing affordable housing but with new construction um, and not simply hang on to old derelict buildings because that's the only place we have affordable housing. And so with that, I'll let Margaret talk a little more detail about the, the Boise initiative. Now? Yes, okay. you're on the spot. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, so, you know, I'm going to tread carefully here because, you know, I cover it and I don't want to be really giving my, my opinion here too much. Um, you know, I'm just going to, but I, but I will share some observations. I think that the word affordable housing means different things to different people. So the affordable housing units that would be constructed under this bonus would only be 10 or 20% of a project if a project meets the city's certain specifications. 
Um, and so 10 or 20% of units is like, you know, if it's a 10 unit building, you have one or two. So that's, you know, you guys do the math. Um, it's, it's not going to be 100% affordable units. It's kind of meant to be one or two kind of everywhere with the idea of, all right, we're building, we're increasing density, we're building up, we're building density, and we're getting more units. But this phrase affordable housing, I think, is what's tripping people up because whenever you're looking at the federal definition of affordable housing, the way the city is defining it is people that make between 100% and 80% of area median income. And that's, so this is targeting people that, that make less than, I think it was like $56,000 a year for a single adult. And so I think there's a lot of people who maybe make minimum wage or even, you know, $12 an hour who are like, are you kidding me? That's what the affordable housing is going to. And then if you look at those rents, which are going to be set by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, you know, someone, you know, making in that 80 to 100 percent range would be paying, I think the figure, and I don't have the exact number in front of me, is, you know, $1,000 a month. And technically that is a third of someone's income. But I think there's also a lot of people who who are in that that 80 to 100 percent range. You know, they've got a college degree. They're working at a pretty good job and um, they're, you know, and they're still struggling with affordability in Boise. And that's what this is targeted at. But that person is probably burdened by student loans. That person is probably paying a car payment and that person maybe has a kid. And so. I don't know how helpful those units are going to be to someone that's going to pay, you know, $1,000 a month when, you know, if you hunt hard enough, as of right now, there are other places in Boise. I mean, you're going to have to get lucky. You're going to have to do, you know, get some sort of Hail Mary pass there. But there are places in Boise where you could probably rent for less. Um, and so there are a lot of people that are looking at this proposal and saying, okay, so the city is giving away extra height. They're giving away more, more density. They're giving away parking restrictions for what? For one or two apartments that are going to rent for like 1300 a month for a family of four. That's insane. And, and that's, and so in the sense that, you know, in, in, in the sense that it's, it would probably incentivize developers to build more units, allow us to have a denser city and, and get closer to those goals of building a thousand units a year. I think, yes, it, it, it will be helpful. But I also think that there's a lot of Boiseans who, if they're a family of four and their rent, their affordable rent is $1,300 a month, it will break them. And you really can't discount that. George, any other thoughts on that one? Yeah, that's spot on, and that and that is the debate. Uh, it's the uh, small A affordable versus the capital A affordable, and the people inside City Hall and the people inside the business uh, uh, go by the uh, by the data and uh, the the eighty percent to one hundred percent. And I think uh, Margaret, you're right. I think it's a thousand thirty four for a single individual is eighty percent, and it's up as, as high as thirteen hundred dollars. I think there's probably going to be more of a conversation of that 80% and where is the flexibility of moving it a little lower than 80%. Um, the, the project that uh, intrigued me the most in the last, uh, in, in most recent memory was the Adair Manor project. And uh, well, interestingly enough, Dina Lachiato's fingerprints are all over that. Uh, but the thing that made that happen was that that was city property. And there's a map. I know I've talked about this before. There's a map at City Hall, and you'd be stunned to see how much city-owned property there is inside Boise. And that is not necessarily an ace in the hole, but that can make things happen. And that developer would not have moved forward if he hadn't made this incredible sweetheart deal for something like a dollar a year or something like that uh, for the property and then moved it forward. And Adair Matter had that many more affordable there, there's that word again, affordable units. That was a really interesting project. My sense is uh, you've got to be really creative because you lose people real fast when you tell people, well, $1,300 is affordable. Yeah, another issue that's affecting homeowners across our region is 
property taxes. We've seen that imbalance between residential and commercial, and you've seen this topic come up at the state legislature. They had a, a committee on it, and they released some um, recommendations, which were mostly tied to the cities and the municipalities were spending too much money, um, which isn't going to go over well with our cities. Um, another thing um, we've seen is um, Boise and Meridian and Ada County not taking that 3% additional uh, increase. So where do you see this issue moving um, in the legislative session? Is there going to be any movement, any looking at the homeowner's exemption uh, to change that around? And uh, Margaret, I'll start with you on that one. Well, I'm curious to see what what is going to happen this year. I I would say that we're we're not going to see. I, I don't expect to see any movement on homeowners exemption, or the circuit breaker, or any of those you know proposals um, from Democrats or you know from Democrats that would you know, to get enough traction with with the Republicans. Um, there's really when I've talked with with Republicans, I, especially you know House Majority Leader Mike Moyle, who's been really driving the conversation on property taxes in the House, he he's very much he's not in favor of any of those programs. And I think he summed it up very well. He goes, "Look, these proposals come from Democrats. They're looking to spend more. They're looking for more money to solve problems. As Republicans, I'm looking for less money to cut money to cut spending. And and that's and he's like, that's just how it is." And so on something, unless something radically changes, I don't, I don't think, um, I don't really expect to see any movement on that, but I would expect that that, uh, that compromise that Jim Rice, Senator Jim Rice um, from Caldwell is pushing to kind of cap how much cities can increase their taxes every year. I expect that will be a much friendlier. Mike Moyle suggested something similar to that last year. And it was, I think, too extreme for the Senate. And so, um, you know, Senator Rice kind of brokered that a little bit softer of a proposal. And I think that's likely, if anything, I think that's likely what will come forward. Um, there is just a lot of frustration in the State House with localities raising raising taxes year after year, taking new construction taxes. Um, to try to keep up with with some of the growth, um, and I I just I don't necessarily know if city and county officials are seeing eye to eye with the the leadership in the state house. George, yeah, you talk to people at the top of the org charts of the governments, and they say the economy is just going swell, and uh, you talk to folks, and they say what? Hello. Um, and you're, you're going to take the maximum amount uh, tax increase again? Are you proposing that? Um, in uh, today's city council meeting, uh, buried inside their meeting packet is uh, their budget adjustments. It's, it's, it's fascinating to see, and it's usually about seven or 10 pages of things that, of money that they're moving around. And you'll see things like $180,000 for leadership development and things that just bump up the that upper echelon of the org chart. But then in today's uh, budget changes, Parks and Rec is, is estimating a loss of a million dollars in revenue. And parking is estimating tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of loss of revenue. Um, and it doesn't take a CPA to figure out there's either gotta be cuts or tax increases. And that's gonna be a hard sell and that will probably decide the fate of some people on the city council when they're on the ballot in November. Yeah, and I think, I think there's a tremendous opportunity for compromise all around because, you know, the thing is that everyone is right. You know, Mike Moyle is right. You know, they're, they're um, and not all cities are created equally. And I think when you look at some cities and counties increasing their budgets astronomically while property taxes are increasing, you know, he's right. Uh, that may not be the case in CUNA, though, or, or Star, um, or some uh, rural counties, or Melba. They don't have money to, to waste and throw around and to cut. Um, and, 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 but the problem is that they're, they're not looking at these all-inclusive solutions. So raising the homeowner's exemption, um, I mean, what's been happening is that shift of the property tax burden 
from commercial to residential is real. And it started really when they capped the homeowner's exemption. And it, it, just, and it will continue even if, even if cities and counties don't raise their budget, if the increase in residential property values exceeds the increase in commercial property values, you're gonna to continue to see that shift more and more. And so um, I, I, I'm, I, I, I'm hopeful that, that Senator Rice can, can come up with a little bit more of a big picture, all inclusive, because there's so many pieces to a property tax bill and there are so many moving parts that if you do little tweaks to a bunch of different parts, you're gonna make a real difference um, in, in property taxes. Uh, but it seems to be that, you know, Mike Moyle wants to do his way and then no other solutions. Whereas I, you know, I'm hopeful that the legislators can come up with a compromise that, that tweaks all of these little pieces. Am I optimistic that's gonna happen? Um, not not terribly. <laughs> uh, also tied to property taxes is uh, school construction funding. Um, districts in our area still rely on bond measures for new school construction. Um, how long do you think residents will accept this as the only way to fund new school construction? And a second part of that question, do you believe the pandemic is going to fundamentally change the way that we look at schooling? And I'll start with you, George, on this one. Yeah, the short answer is absolutely. Uh, the longer answer, uh, so the Boise School Board will meet later today. And I was looking at their enrollment numbers. And at the end of November, there were 1,570 fewer students in the Boise School District enrolled uh, compared to a year ago. Those are real numbers that, uh, that moves toward uh, uh, funding. Obviously, it's, uh, it's, the pandemic has everything to do with that, but numbers are numbers. Uh, the Boise School District has been fat and happy in that I can't remember the last time uh, a bond measure ever went down to defeat. Uh, they know how to get those passed. Um, I think uh, it's probably going to be a little tougher going forward. Uh, they have taken for granted. Uh, the, the voters have, uh, have supported them. They say, what do you need? And absolutely. And as a result, the school uh, district does extremely well and has a lot of new construction and remodeling. Uh, there wasn't one school that hasn't either been rebuilt or remodeled in the district. Uh, outside the Boise School District, it's a very, very different picture. Um, and, and, and the numbers are dropping. People have either held their kids back, moved away, uh, but they haven't really been able to drill into those numbers. And by the time that they do, the formula, it will result in probably less funding. Scott. Um, concerning bond measures, you know, again, the, the, one of the solutions is very simple and it just, it continues to be not looked at and that's allowing school districts to collect impact fees. You know, you look at a school district like West Ada um, or CUNA where they have to build new schools. You know, if a school costs $15 million to, to build, the only way you can do that is by passing a bond, a bond measure that is borne by the entire school district. Whether you've lived there for five months or 50 years or five generations, um, the building of new schools is necessitated by people coming into the district, the new people, and that new growth is not paying for those new school buildings. Without those new people moving in, you do not need a new school, and so you do not need a bond measure. Um, now, when you ask Republican legislators or candidates, you know, if they're in favor of allowing school districts to collect impact fees, really the only answer that they give is that as long as they don't pass bond measures, you know, in the dark of night in March and May. And it's, you know, the reality is that the school district, if it wants to build a new school, it costs $15 million to build a new school. And where's that money gonna come from? Well, you know, if you don't have um, impact fees to collect from new growth, the only way to get it is through a bond measure. So um, um, again, am I optimistic that the legislature is gonna uh, allow this to happen? Uh, you know, I haven't been optimistic for the past uh, four years that this has uh, come up as a topic and we've talked about this in this panel uh, for probably the past four years and it still hasn't happened and 
I don't see any reason that it is, is gonna change. So I think we're gonna be stuck continuing to ask all of the taxpayers um, for, uh, for bond measures every year. Um, and really quickly about the pandemic changing, the way we look at schooling, I don't think so. I think that, that people wanna send their kids back to school. I don't think there's gonna be all of a sudden a resurgence to homeschool or distance learning, or I think that people really want to um, get their kids back in a, a classroom. Um, I do think that we're going to see something about student-centered education coming up in the uh, legislative session where there's going to be a push perhaps to have school vouchers to allow um, families to use taxpayer dollars to send their kids to private school. So keep an eye out for that. And I think the pandemic has kind of nudged that debate along a little bit. Margaret, any other thoughts on that one? Yeah, I'm going to agree with Scott on that. I think the reason that enrollment is dropping is because not because people don't like what their public school is doing is that that they supported what they were doing before. Um, and, you know, kind of they're, you know, feeling like, well, all right, if my kid's going to have to do third grade on Zoom, I guess I can just, you know, figure out something else. And I think there's a lot of high higher income families who can afford to do this, who have created pods where they, they, they're a pod with some other families and they hire a private teacher and they've got their six kids in the neighborhood that are all friends and they have a, a classroom in somebody's garage and they're doing school that way and technically and 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 they're like all right we're going to return to school when school is is back to normal and so i wouldn't in in i wouldn't necessarily view this as a rejection of 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 the old way of public schooling, I would say that this kind of shows how people want to be back there. They want to be doing that. Um, and as far as the ballot measures and the pandemic, I wrote something about this a couple months ago um, after there were several bond measures that either narrowly passed or narrowly failed. Like the, you know, in West Data, they had, they initially had their supplemental levy fail. And um, I think I believe it since then it has passed. Um, I um, don't don't quote me on that. But at the time I was talking to some, you know, some leaders in West Ada and they, you know, and they were saying, okay, what we're hearing is that people who always supported this didn't support it this year because they didn't have the extra money from the from the pandemic. And they were concerned about that. Um, and that blew a hole, a $14 million hole in the West Ada budget. And that supplemental levy was being used for run the business type expenses. And I think that there, there really is, there is a really, as property taxes continue to rise, there will be less willingness from people to vote for those supplemental levies, especially people who don't have school age children. And I don't know what happens then. Because if you're needing 14 million to conduct everyday business and then all of a sudden you don't get it, that, that kind of creates a lot of questions. So we've got about 17 minutes left. I'll ask our viewers to start populating that chat box with uh, questions so we can get into the Q&A here in a minute. I do want to ask a question about Transportation, we also saw some significant turnover on the ACHD board. David McKinney is taking over for Sarah Baker, and it looks like Alexis Pickering is going to be taking over for Rebecca Arnold, pending some court challenges after the recount. I think the final vote total was a difference of four votes, so we'll see how that one plays out. But given those changes in the makeup of ACHD, do you see any significant um, changes to their policy? and? what their funding priorities are gonna to go towards or is it going to be kind of the status quo? And I'll start with Scott on that one. Yeah, I think it'll be, it's gonna be interesting. It's going to, there are gonna be some interesting ACHD commission meetings. You know, Dave McKinney is, uh, ran on much more of a road centric, you know, respond to development, widen uh, some of these uh, two lane country roads. Uh, very, you know, that was his, his main platform was that we've got these country roads, two lane country roads that we need to widen to accommodate uh, the increased traffic and respond to the development that's happening where it happens. Um, you know, Jim Hansen and Alexis Pickering are a little more, um, want to be a little more proactive in providing incentives for, for people to get out of their cars. 
um, and want to look at policy changes that they can make. Um, I, you know, I think it, it comes down to a matter of funding. And I think, you know, the, we interviewed all six candidates for ACHD commission, and I don't think any one of them had a really good answer about where the, the money is going to come from, because no matter what plan you want to take, whether you want to grow roads by doubling and, and turning two lane country roads into four lane uh, mini highways, or whether you want to increase um, multimodal transit and divided bike lanes, whatever plans you want to enact, it's going to require more money. And I don't think any one of them really had really great answers about where that money is going to come from. So seeing who wins the debate of the day on, on how to proceed with those policy changes and then how you're going to pay for it is going to be interesting how it plays out. It's certainly more dynamic now than it was, um, you know, two months ago. Margaret. Yeah, I, I think that it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Um, it wasn't a total flip of the board. Uh, Dave McKinney, you know, is relatively conservative in the sense that, like Scott said, he's road centric and, um, you know, really didn't have a ton of enthusiasm for supporting public transit, which has been the major, the major question over there where some, you know, where Jim Hansen and I'm guessing Alexis Pickering are, are, are more in favor of let's figure out how we can get ACHD resources to either directly fund transit if possible, which is something that Jim Hansen argues they can do, or which it's kind of a legal question, or use our resources to further prop that system up. Whereas other people on the board are much more like, you know, you know, Rebecca Arnold argues, she's like, legally, we cannot do that. We cannot support transit. And so there's kind of this ongoing legal fight over what they're actually allowed to do with public transit. Um, so, you know, McKinney is still, he's replacing on the, Sarah Baker on the board, who was a more conservative pro-roads person, and then he's coming in as a more conservative pro-roads person. Obviously, Rebecca Arnold losing her seat to Alexis Pickering adds to that dimension. I think it's going to change, and there's going to be a lot more, um, you know, three to two votes and in the other way, maybe than they were before, but it's certainly not the drastic flip that it could have been. Like, I think if, if, if Dave McKinney had not won and um, Emily Jackson Edney, who was a much more public transit focused candidate had, had won and the whole board was majority pro public transit, that would be, that would be a different, a different day. And now I, I think it's like we're it's kind of moving in that more public transit direction, but it's not like it's more of like maybe we'll go this way instead of just like a oh, total 180. And I think that that's it's hard to predict since it wasn't such a drastic shift. George. I think even with Dave McKinney uh, aboard. The absence of Sarah Baker, uh, Baker and uh, Rebecca Arnold, uh, we're going to see a lot more, uh, a lot less friction uh, with the city of Boise. Uh, number one, uh, I, I, the uh, the worst kept secret is that ACHD staff work, works incredibly well with city staff, uh, but when it comes to those board meetings, that's that's where there has been so much friction. Um, I think we're going to hear a lot more about the state street uh, transport, uh, the SSTOP plan, I think it is, uh, which is the eternal uh, conversation about uh, turning uh, state street into seven or eight lanes. I think we're going to uh, revise the HOB conversation. Um, I don't think uh, light rail is anywhere near a possibility, in spite of the fact that we have a new president that loves trains. I don't think that's going to matter at all. Uh, I think, uh, uh, but uh, transit and transportation, uh, and we've talked a little bit about density and building up and closer to transit routes. I think we're going to be hearing a lot more about that uh, and funding of Valley Regional Transit is a big deal. In the last several months, I don't think people, I don't think it's been getting a lot of notice, but Valley Regional Transit has been cutting routes um, in uh, the west part of the uh, Treasure Valley. And uh, so I think that uh, uh, the city of Boise is going to have very particular asks uh, for what they want. 
So we've got our first viewer question and it is also related to property taxes. So I'll go ahead and ask you guys this. I'll start with George on this one. Um, can you speak to rising property taxes for non-owner occupied properties? We talk about affordable housing, but one of the reasons rents are going up is because the landlord's property taxes are going up. Increasing the homeowner's exemption may help homeowners, but what about tenants? Do we do? Um, I, I think, uh, again, I do think that the increase is, uh, is, is coming. Um, but uh, I'm sorry, again, the question is about non-occupied uh, properties? Non-owner occupied properties, yes. Non-owner occupied properties. Um, I, uh, we might see the conversation again regarding um, uh, what everyone was uh, debating a year ago, and that is uh, the uh, uh, turning your properties into short-term rentals. Um, and I think that there's probably going to, I think that that's going to surface again. Yeah, I think that's a good question. I think that it, it definitely, if you increase the homeowner's exemption, you are going to shift that burden to non-owner occupied um, housing. And, you know, I think if it's enough of a problem, you know, just like the homeowner's exemption and just like the circuit breaker program, you know, can you lobby, can, uh, landlords lobby for some sort of uh, exemption of their own so that they can make the argument that, well, if my property taxes are, you know, $4,400 a year, that just means that I have to raise my rent by $4,400 just to cover my taxes. You know, can they successfully lobby the legislature for their own exemption um, out of that? Um, I don't know, but, but that is a valid, that's a valid point, a valid question, uh, because that would exacerbate the problem for for non-owner occupied uh, properties yeah no that's a good that is a good question and i wish that there was a there was a good answer to it i think that there's a lot of concern about about landlords and and how they're able to um you know to make it through the pandemic and they're able to kind of deal with rising taxes and other things like that um, I, I, I think that landlords are in a good position right now because, you know, for every, every unit that has someone move out, there's 20 people in line to move in. So landlords are really in that position where they, they are going to be able to get those rent increases to pay their property taxes and they are going to be able to fill, fill their units. But it, 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 but it does, it does impact the tenants and, and property taxes do, do impact people. I think that the answer is going to be that Idaho really relies on property taxes to pay for a lot of things. And local governments, property taxes is like two thirds of the city of Boise's budget. And I'm, I'm wondering if we're going to get to a point, not next year, not the year after, um, but sometime down the line where the state is going to have to have a real conversation of should everything we pay for be on the backs of property owner, property taxes, because no matter what you do, it, it, it impacts it, it. The biggest crisis we have in Idaho, I would argue right now is affordable housing. And and it's in and property taxes directly impact that problem. And I think that there's going to be a point where there needs to be a conversation of do we need to reevaluate how how we're taxing and and try to spread that burden out. And I don't know, I'm not an expert. I don't know what that answer looks like, but I think that's the best hope for that problem is to say, let's look at some other states property tax model how are they how are they funding for services because if the only way to get a paramedic to my house is property taxes i don't know how we're going to we're going to go on in 10 years so we don't have any other viewer questions at this time but uh, i do have another question um 2020 has been a tough year for everybody in one way or another I want to know what you guys are looking forward to covering in 2021. What stories are you anticipating are going to be the biggest stories of 2021? Um, and I think we'll start with Margaret on that one. So anybody who follows Boise, just get ready because 2021 is going to be insane. Um, 
there's i'll start with like the nerdiest stuff first um there's the budget i mean george alluded to it the city is really having to do looking down at some cuts they're looking or raising taxes or just making they're 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 looking at having to make it work in a way that city of boise has not had to make it work in a long time under dave beater the economy was doing relatively well they raised taxes three percent every year and they took new growth every single year and hardly anybody said boo and they were funding you know getting ready to build a hundred million dollar library and everything was going great and now the pandemic hit and there's a lot more frustration in the community of raising those taxes and so budget talks in 2021 are going to be really in interesting and i'm curious to see if there will be cuts what those cuts will be and what that conversation is going to look like. I think it's going to divide the city council in a way that they have not been divided on the budget in a long time. Um, and then of course, we're gonna have a November election and George has mentioned this several times. We're gonna have three seats up and those seats because of action in the legislature will be divided. They will, they will be divided into districts for the first time. And um, I think there's a lot of hope in the Republicans, for, from Republicans, that that's going to, to make city council more conservative. I'm not convinced that it's gonna make the city like city council all conservative, but I think that that really could introduce some more moderate or even one very conservative you know, voice to because of geography, like from the Western part of the city that will come in and shake up the conversation and, and also potentially move council members who are running to the right in a way that they've never had to run before. Um, also, there is the looming question of how the city is going to implement the districting from the state that was required because the state's bill on districting the city um, didn't really have much specifics. And so this last I heard, the city was kind of wrestling with are we gonna make council members who live in the same neighborhood run against each other? Is someone gonna lose their seat? So, so many, so much happening, so much happening. It's gonna be crazy. George. Yeah, I think that's it. Um, uh, it'll be really interesting to see the city sliced up uh, for the city council races and they'll probably have to slice it up again after uh, that election. Um, once we look at the census, um, I do believe there's going to be a significant pandemic hangover, and I think that, that it's going to impact everything. I, do, I think that there are way too many businesses that are still hanging on and depleting their savings and running up uh, their debt. Uh, I think that uh, we're, we're going to see that. I think at the State House, I think uh, we're going to see a wider split between the governor and the legislature as they try to strip powers from him. They have said as much that they will do just that. They said that during the uh, brief special session. I think that'll be interesting. And uh, and I, I think that the, the overriding uh, conversation, once uh, more of us are, are out among each other again, I think uh, we're going to talk a lot about our, our individual tax burden and what our leaders can or cannot do for us. And that will drive many of our decisions at a municipal level. Real quick, I'll add to that. Redistricting is going to be happening next year. Uh, we're going to get new legislative districts. I think that's going to be an interesting debate. Um, education funding, like I said before, I think there's going to be a debate on student-centered uh, funding models to try to get uh, tax dollars to follow students. I think the Expo Idaho is going to come to a head uh, in the coming year. And I am going to be most interested, everything, everything, everything hinges on our COVID vaccine uptake. If we can get enough people to take the vaccine, we can get back to business as normal. If we don't get enough people to take the vaccine, we're gonna be stuck in pandemic land. Good point, Scott. And we are right at 9.59. So I wanna thank our panelists, Scott McIntosh, George Prentice, and Margaret Carmel for joining us. I know our um, members really enjoyed this. For our members, our next 59-minute uh, meeting will be in March, and uh, we hope that you have a good, a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, and we'll see you all in 2021. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.